I know I who you're going to take. I know who you're going to take. Yeah, I'm going to take JaVale. Oh, my God. You're making fun of me? All right, 2008 redraftables. Do you want the first pick or the second pick? Uh, Really? I think the thing is the third pick is the interesting thing. So you know what? You can have the first pick. Well, if you think the third pick's interesting, no, you I want to see what you're going to do. No, I want to see right. what you're going to do. All right. First pick, Russell Westbrook, MVP, two first team all NBAs, five second teams, two third teams, averaging a 25, seven and eight in the playoffs, 23, seven, eight for his career. And uh, we've talked about him way too much on this podcast. I don't have a lot more to say. I will be interested to know. How much is left for him? He's already at 20,000 points. He's played 12 years, 874 games. The next five years of his career are going to be fun to see how they play out from uh, f- athleticism, durability, all that stuff. I don't, it, you could tell me that it's going to be a quick downturn, or you could tell me he's just a freak and he's going to just be doing this until like he's 38. I don't know the answer. I wouldn't want to bet on. Uh, bet against him finding a way to be productive just because of his intensity. Like, I just, I just think that's the way this guy is wired. And that's the part of him I love the most. I do think our reaction to him would be very different if it wasn't, uh, maybe not very different because this is a, this is a bigger picture thing, but the way he turned it around this year too in Houston, after it being just abysmal the first few months, and then they get rid of the center, they open the whole thing up and he's putting up these monster numbers again. But I just think wherever he is, I don't know that you're going to win any playoff games. But wherever he is, he's just going to care more than almost everybody else that's out there. And he's just going to find, like, he's going to get those in-between buckets. He's going to get buckets that other guys just don't have the effort level for. So I think he's always going to be kind of productive even later on as the athleticism slips. You're up on the clock number two. By the way, Russ has 7,000 more points than anyone in this class, 3,000 more assists, 3,300 more assists, and he's third in rebounds in this entire class. Okay, um, I, I... I don't really think there's much debate here. I think it's Kevin Love. Love, it's a weird story for him, though. I mean, monster numbers, like exactly what you would want. Stretch four, who is incredible from the three-point line. For his career, he's 37%. But one year with Minnesota, he's 42%. The next year, he's 26 points a game, 13 boards. He's got another 20 and 15 game in there or season in there. He had like a weird year where he couldn't hit any threes for some. Oh, he was hurt that year. He, uh, he hurt his uh, he hurt his hand or his wrist. That's right. He played he made, 18 games. He made a second team on NBA in 12 and 14, and then 13 he was hurt. That's right. Okay, so then he comes back and plays basically a full season at 25 years old in Minnesota. His last year there, he's 26, 12 and a half, 38% from three and seven attempts. But it was this constant battle. Like, Rambus didn't want to play him. They gave him the shorter year on the contract. They're like, is this guy... You know, like some of these guys in this class, like, hey, what happened to O.J. Mayo's numbers? Well, the weird thing is, is once he started shooting less, the team got a little bit better. There's a few guys in this, like when Beasley has those big numbers, okay, they didn't even win 20 games that year. So there's, you always got to look at some of these numbers and go, what do these numbers really mean when the teams are losing all the time? Then you can see the teams get a little bit better, and then these guys take less shots. Uh, That's not necessarily the case for Love. He goes to Cleveland. We know there's not going to be as many shots for him. He loses like six shots per game from 14 to his first year in Cleveland, but he's still hitting threes. He's just missing time. He missed most in 18, 19. He's still only 31 years old. So I think he's oddly, like I said before, become a little underrated, but he's so lost in Cleveland and he signs the big contract, but he's, he's a productive player who's put up maybe misleading gaudy numbers, but still puts up really good numbers, but he was invisible in LeBron's shadow and now invisible on a bad team. No one cares about. I have two Kevin love points. First one is I really like the early version of Kevin Love before he actually was overqualified to be doing what he was doing. And and it made more sense for him to be a 26 and 12 year guy at the end of games guy. His his uh, third season in the league, he averages 20 and 15, four and a half offensive rebounds a game. Four and a half. Yeah, he led the league in rebounding. And when you and when you went to see him, it was so much fun watching him on the offensive boards because he really like was religious about, you know, a little like Rodman style. Um, it was one of the best rebounders I've ever seen. And I think it's a shame that as his career went along, he drifted further and further away from the basket. You take this guy when he's around the rim 
one of the best offensive rebounders, I think, of the last 20 years. And then as a defensive rebounder, one of the best outlet passers. And yeah. I just love that version of him. I, I, I really wish he didn't go to Cleveland, which is my second point. And I know it worked out. They won the title, the whole thing. But I think for the most part, it's been a waste of his talents. Because I think LeBron, in a lot of ways, was a power forward anyway. If you just look at his playoff stats, right? He only, he's only in the playoffs four years. His playoff stats, he's 15 and 10, 40% field goal, 40% three-point, 85% free throw, only 2.3 offensive rebounds a game. And here's the killer, 3.7 free throws a game. He's basically being used as Ryan Anderson. And I just think it's a complete waste of what that guy's good at. I, I want that guy around the rim. He's got unbelievable hands, quick feet some of the best instincts we've seen of anyone in the last 25 years and you have them in the fucking corner. I know they had to do it that way, but I just think it's a shame. I wish we could do his career over again. Yeah, that 25 year old season, 13 and 14 again, he's 77 games, 26, 12 and a half, eight free throw attempts per game. And he makes his free throws. He's 83% from the floor. And he, I got to say he, he was unstoppable in the paint. Like if there was a rebound, he was usually getting it. He was great at up fake stuff. Like he was a very old school kind of the player that you and I grew up with, but like navigating yeah, but he this could shoot. modern world, but he could shoot. Like, I, I just think it's a bummer. He went to Cleveland. I really do. And it, that's not a knock on LeBron. I just kind of, I think he was overqualified to do what he did for Cleveland. JD He's, drew rule here in effect, because if they don't come back from three, one, do we look at his career differently? I lo I'm looking at his career as a guy who in the playoffs is 15 and 10, which is just not that special. And I got to be and honest. By the way, th those numbers feel high because of how many times in the playoffs you were like, what's going on with him right now? Right. They're a little inflated by some of the easy series. I got to be honest. I had him third. I had Derrick Rose second. So here's the okay. case. Um, <laughs> you think it's not even debatable, huh? No, I think it's very debatable. Okay. I, I just, I had Rose second on my list because... He's an MVP. I think that matters. I think the injury was a fluke. Maybe it would have happened anyway because the way he played. I certainly was afraid watching him that he was going to get hurt. And I always have felt that way about Westbrook too. Certain guys where you're, you're John Morant's like that. I'm constantly worried he's going to get hurt by the way he plays. So maybe it would have happened Agreed. anyway. I don't know. But, you know, you think like year three, wins the MVP. He's the best guy in a 60-win team. 25-7-4, and 45%, 33-86. Um, for the percentages and he's like 22 and I, the question I keep asking with some of this stuff is if you play his career 20 times, is this one of the best versions, one of the mediocre versions or one of the worst versions? I think it's probably one of the worst versions. I, I think there's a world where Westbrook and Rose, if, if Westbrook hurts his knee, maybe as you pointed out before, Westbrook's so tough mentally he was going to fight through it. Rose, he has a lot of a lot of issues, obviously. Maybe he's not as strong fighting through an injury and recovering, things like that. But I just think it was bad luck. And I think the upside of him was just higher than Kevin Love. I think he's a better basketball player. Kevin Love, to me, if he's putting up huge stats, I don't know if you're winning. And it, it's weird because I, it's almost like the most overqualified ever version of David Lee. Where it's like, if David Lee is this involved in your team, what's ultimately happening? Because he can't guard anybody on the other end. Now we know with the league where it's like, you don't really need a power forward who's six nine, who's constantly in a mismatch, getting in pick and rolls, but he can't play center. So that would be my, I know what Derrick Rose is. I know I can contend for a title if he's one of my best three players, he's healthy. I guess I, I just push back on the idea that because the ACL thing happened, that that's fluky and then none of the other stuff is is fluky because it was a real problem for him in Chicago when he came back and how True. long it took him to come back and what was happening and you know this was some of the early signs of 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 the pro player coverage in that it's like well you know it's his body and if he's worried it's like yeah okay but you know eventually when you're cleared and people want you back and think you're coming back and have a uniform ready for you to go in a playoff game, and then you're not. Like that's that's screwing up everybody else on the team. And the remember the Knicks moment where he just disappeared. 
and well, I think, you go, <laughs> what's right. going on? And it it was actually like the fact that he is who he is the last two years, Bill, is incredible. And it's, you know, like I'm, I'm so happy for him because I hate like you that we missed out on this awesome version. But if we're doing this redraft and like what you have to your team, there was some real weird moments there for Rose where I guess I can't really blame him. A young kid whose career is completely derailed based on like being a Hall of Famer, maybe contending for titles. But there was some stuff that was really hard to explain with him for a bunch of seasons. And he basically missed like five or six years, not total, but seasons where he doesn't even come close to playing a half a year. He reminds me of a lot of guys that we grew up watching that I loved who got derailed for dumb reasons. You know, whether it was Michael Ray Richardson or Walter Davis, guys like that because of cocaine or guys who just had a knee injury at the wrong time or both. Um, but you look back at their career, what it should have been versus what it actually was. And I was looking at that and I'm like, well, why did it turn out that way? With him, I think the knee injury was bad luck. I don't think he had the kind of infrastructure around him to kind of cope with the bad luck. Whereas I think if Westbrook had torn his ACL, he just would have, he would have been back in 11 months. He would have been like, I'm not letting this beat me for whatever reason, Rose let it beat him. And I think he had a really hard life and he had a lot of, a lot of issues on and off the court. And, uh, you know, it's just a bummer. Uh, I, I look, I remember in my basketball book, I wrote about, I had a hall of fame. I wanted to have these different wings. And one of the wings was like the comets, like these guys that, they weren't Hall of Famers, but they had like this two-year window where you're like, man, I'll never forget watching that guy. I feel like he's like that for me. He's one of those comic guys for me. I, I thought he was unbelievable in person those couple years. Yeah, the, it's tough for me to win the argument with love over Rose, though, when you talk about winning games because Rose was winning games. I mean, they won 58 games that year as the MVP. They were the one seed in the East. Or excuse me, they won 62 games. Miami, as I said before, won 58. And love was almost like, power forward Trey Young in in a way. Uh he was. He was so, you know, that, Sharif, the Sharif Abdul Rahim All Stars, I used to call him. You want him on the fantasy team, but not maybe not in real life as much. But yeah. you know, I gotta say, he came through huge in the uh in 2016. Like that that he he stopped Curry on the biggest defensive stop of that entire season and made a couple of big plays and that counts for something. I did have a few Warriors uh, people reach out on the on the Love Curry thing, and they, they were quick to point out that Curry admits he just was going for the kill shot there, because I still mm. think he could have gotten around Kevin Love. Um, well, that that's another what if with him, right? Because it was Clay Thompson, Clay Thompson, David Lee for Love was the trade that was on the table, and there the Warriors were split on it, and ended up they ended up not doing it, and probably a good idea because you know, how it played out was how it played out. All right, you're on the clock at number four. But I'm going Brooke Lopez. Wow. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. This is a fun draft. Yeah. Now, I had Lopez, him sixth. Lopez went from 20 a game, not great Nets teams, didn't rebound enough, set up so far away from the hoop. And you're like, what the hell is this? Like, why are you, post why are you posting up on a entry pass? Like, why am I... You're catching a ball 18 feet away from the hoop, and you're just going to take a turnaround. But he got enough shots, and he also got to the free throw line, and he was pretty good from his free throw line. But you just you went from like, ah, oh, man, he just doesn't because he rebounded all right. Um, his his first couple of years, and it just got worse and worse. You're like, why this guy just doesn't rebound? And then he completely reinvents himself, he signs for just above the minimum essentially, and somebody that didn't take any threes the first. Uh, seven, eight years of his career, five a game, four a game, six a game, five a game. He wasn't shooting it as well this year with Milwaukee, but he was great the previous three years from three, and he's reinvented himself. And I think as a mobile defensive big who can cover a lot of ground, I actually feel, still think he's going to be productive for a while. So I like him better than some of the other people that statistically are are looked on more favorably from this class. Average 20 plus four times. Had some bad luck with how it worked out for him, right? He's they put together that net super team and Darren Williams just ends up flaking. They the the whole he's there through the whole fall of Prokhorov era. Ends up on the 2018 Lakers for some reason. Um, and it's just 
I I'm with you. I always liked him. I always thought he was kind of semi unstoppable when he, when he posted up and there was the year, one of the years the Celtics had actually had both of the years, they had the Nets pick and my dad and I would just be rooting against the Nets and Lopez would just like win, just win the Nets, these games. And it was so fucking frustrating and be like, you know, they're down one with 11 seconds left coming out of a timeout. Like just double team Lopez. Can, can he not have the ball? And then he'd end up, you know, and one Brooke Lopez. And, uh, I just thought he was really good. So I'm glad it, I'm glad it worked out for him, but he's another guy like with, Ke like same way I feel about Kevin Love. I hate that all these guys are so far from the basket. I think he's like unstoppable within six feet. If he's got the right guy in his hip, you know, and, and now he's just like but now a he's, point shooter. He, yeah. But now he's not even that guy. And I think that's why I actually like him more because before I would just, it was just weird with him. He would set up so much further away than normally a guy on a, on a post catch. Now nobody runs post offense anyway. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Done. But I mean, yeah. the other crazy thing about him, the last couple of years, he's basically a career high blocks per game, which doesn't happen. You usually don't play 10 years and then start blocking more shots. But a lot of that is how smart he is. And he's also high on the teammate grade thing too. So totally. Uh, and, and the defensive metrics back it up. He's, the eye test says he's, oh, he's kind of better defensively than I realized he was. And then all the metrics are backing up. My uh, my fifth pick is going to be Serge Ibaka. I just love guys like this. I, I, know, I know I can just play him in a playoff series. And he's probably going to be playing crunch time for me unless I have an awesome center. The, the, some of his numbers, like in 2012, he averaged 3.7 blocks a game. I don't remember that. That's a lot of blocks. He averaged three blocks a game in 13. Um, then he just stopped. <laughs> yeah, but became, for the most part, a pretty good open three-point shooter eventually. Unfortunately, he didn't really learn that skill until uh, after OKC, their window closed for the uh, title. But um, in the playoffs, he did pretty well, too. Is somebody that, he played 133 games in the playoffs so far and averaged 29 minutes a game. So he was always valuable at every point in his career. In Toronto, um, 20.8 minutes a game for them in the 19 run. And he came up huge for them a couple of times during that run. I just always liked him. And I, and I think in 2014, when he gets hurt in that San Antonio series, and then he ends up coming back and whatever the fuck happened. I do think they could have beaten San Antonio that year. And I think his injury changed that. So I had I'm him, I had him fifth. I had him fifth as well. Uh, you know, I had Westbrook love Rose thing. You kind of get me to second guess the bros thing a little bit there, but uh, no, I, guess, I think it's a good argument. Yeah. And then I had Lopez fourth, but I had surge fifth. Uh, surge is, is such an interesting player because he basically was a power forward forever and then he turned into like a two guard on offense and he went from not taking any threes to taking three a game and he hit him but i felt like his blocks overrated him a little defensively where i thought that miami series he made some huge mistakes just kind of not understanding the coverage on some things so are you, you would, talking like, 2012 yeah when they lost in the finals to miami yeah he's he, he, he was pretty some, raw. I felt I felt like it took him a couple years to really be trustworthy in games like that. Yeah, I mean he's only his third year in. He wasn't even yeah. a scorer at that point. But the blocks those next couple of years, like that's three point seven. So that's a third year in. So that's when they were in the finals. Blocks can get really. I mean that's a huge number. So you start to go look at this defensive stopper. And it's like okay, blocking shots though. Like look at Whiteside. Like Whiteside blocks shots, and I think he's one of the worst defensive players in the league. And so. When I, I know, but it's isn't it weird though when you look back and you think they just could have played him at center and Durant at power forward and had two guys who were seven feet and have length, and then just like why play Perkins one minute? Because who else are you going to run that first post play for every single game? Start the game. <laughs> you can't you uh -huh. can't do that to Big Perk. Uh, I, Abaka, you know, the redemption for me because then I kind of felt like he was this lost guy because i go he's so far away from the hoop all the time like he's in love with his shot and he made it but i like you you kind of hope like where you have this great defensive presence who can also be a big who can shoot threes and you're like actually you have just a big who shoots a lot of threes but he was so good in big spots against golden state when they won the title for toronto like he has some moments where he's the only other guy doing anything 
Remember the Kawhi's Philly going off? Yeah. Game seven Philly too. That was the other one. He was that big was the other game. one. So he he jumped up in my book as it's kind of just being like eh, about him for a long time. I'm not saying he sucked or anything like that. I'm not being ridiculous, but for him to show up that way, like he did for Toronto uh, during that 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 championship run, really showed me something with him. So, and I think if you have him for 12 years, you're going to be just happy in general with the 12 years. I forgot Zach Cram sent us a couple of stats. Seven different guys from this draft made an All Star team, which is the most in any draft since 03. The average player from the draft has collected 24.9 win shares, most since 2003. And uh, the total win shares for non-lottery players in 08, which includes Ibaka, ranks third in the whole lottery era. So there you go. All right, you're you're uh, you're in the clock at number six. I think I know who you're taking. DeAndre Jordan? Are you being I ironic? Don't... No, no, I'm taking him. Wow, I never thought you were a fan. Well, at this point, um, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Like, I think he's. I think he's a classic Chris Paul study, where it's like, oh, see what happens when you don't have Chris Paul passing you the basketball every single time. Like, it's 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 a little harder to get yeah. this stuff going. But the rebounding numbers are nuts. He's got like twenty five hundred more rebounds than anybody else in this class. He led the league thirteen and a half, fifteen. He's basically been double figures for a really long time. Yes, there are some Dallas moments there where it's like, I don't think this guy's real locked in right now. And that part I never quite got, but he's the whole reason why Durant's in uh, in Brooklyn. Oh no, wait, that's Kyrie. Uh, I I think DeAndre, when he's right, when he's invested, he's. I mean, it's tough because you know you want everybody to be able to score. So in today's game, you know he he might not be somebody you have to do, but you still have to kind of pay attention to him. And I I still I don't know. I didn't. I was kind of at this point. Like, there's one other name that I would go with, but I could understand. I probably had more arguments for the guy that I was going to pick after DeAndre here than than I had anti DeAndre arguments. So I'm pick, taking him sixth. You left out the dunking with him, which was really fun, especially earlier in his career with the alley. <laughs> when no, with the alley oops, it was just he had a fun early part of his career when he wasn't like a distinct potential all star yet, but was just a fun guy to have in your team, and also great, great. uh Great teammate. Everybody likes him. I did not have him in that spot, though. Okay, who would you take him? With my seventh pick, I'm taking Eric Gordon, who I think is a really good basketball player, who is a classic. If you played this career 20 times, was this the worst scenario of it? I'm just looking at this draft. The actual draft, Chicago Rose, Miami Beasley, Minnesota Mayo trade, Seattle Westbrook, Memphis Love, Knicks six, they take Gallinari. Clippers seven, Eric Gordon. Eight, Milwaukee, Joe Alexander. Even if he goes to the Bucks at eight and he's playing with like Andrew Bogut and whoever else on that Fear the Deer team, I think he would have had such an easier time. Instead, he's on the fucked up Clippers and... You know, and then all of a sudden, when things finally start turning, gets traded to New Orleans. Now it's another rebuild. Then they get Drew Holiday within a year. Then a couple of years go by. He gets hurt a few times. They have, by all accounts, one of the worst medical staffs in the last 20 years of the NBA. Then eventually ends up in Houston, and we kind of saw what would become with him. But um, just, he's just worst case scenario on whatever team, 17 a game, and he's going to make almost 40% of his threes knows where to go, knows what to do. You can run plays from it in the games. His third year with the Clippers, he was 22.3 a game, 45% field goal. And I I got to say, that was a really fun Clippers team because that was Blake. That was, uh, there was Baron Davis for at least a little while. And then they ended up trading Baron Davis to get rid of his contract for Mo Williams. But I really like going to those games. I like Baron Davis with Eric Gordon and, and, and DeAndre starting to come on and Blake starting to emerge. And I enjoyed that team. Like it's a team that if they hadn't made the Chris Paul trade still would have been really fun to watch. Yeah. He was really coming on and there were some other numbers too. Like he, I think he might've been the number one, like shoot off a pick and roll guard in the league that year where you go, okay, this guy has like a real weapon and something you bring. And it was always a little scary because when you watched him for those that saw him in high school and then the year at Indiana, it was really impressive 
but you were kind of like, what kind of athlete is he going to be? Is he going to be one of those guys that's like done athletically too soon? And that's kind of the case, but it hasn't really, like, yes, it's changed who he is as a player, but he's still incredibly productive. I know he wasn't shooting it that well this year, but this is somebody who just lights it up from outside, taking over eight threes a game now. I mean, he scored 18 a game over basically a full season just a couple years ago. And he's, yes, the system, it's the Houston system, and it's all these things, but you'd still want an Eric Gordon on your team. I think because he just, he always looks a little slower. He looks like he's, uh, he, he's just, he's never quite the athlete. Maybe you thought you were going to be when you watched him when he was a little bit younger. But I think the part that's misleading is because he doesn't look like he's this quick twitch guy or a guy who's breaking everybody down. It takes away from the fact that he actually is good at getting to the hoop. Like he is good at initiating contact. And because he's thick, it works to his advantage. Like he, these guys are, all of those Rockets players are, are big in not height, but like, just how strong they all are. And he fits in perfectly with all these different things because he can still handle And Even though he looks like this guy's just going to take a million threes every game, he's somebody that can still handle and get to the hoop and then make the right read on stuff. So I've been really impressed with the second part of his career after worrying like who he was going to be after some of the injuries and then the weird stuff with his contract and like he wanted out and then they weren't going to let him out when he wanted to go to Phoenix. I mean, he had some weird bumpy stuff there where you started worrying like what's this going to look like in year 10 if he's even still around and now I think he's just going to make threes for another five years. You're up at number eight. Danilo. Hmm. I, I, that was my toughest call was who to put at number eight. I think you can make an argument he should have gone ahead of Gordon. I don't know if um, you wanted me to keep updating these, though. Just all the stuff that we have on uh, on the nicknames off of Basketball Reference, because Eric Gordon's got a bunch. A.K. the Hobbit, A.K. E. Money, A.K. E. G. A.K. E. J. A.K. Splash Gordon, A.K. Three G. A.K. Air Gordon. I think they make almost all of those names up of the Basketball I Reference ones. I, I half so of those too. I've never heard in my life. So Gallinari is 16 and five, 38% from three for his career. And, yeah, and he's getting better, by the way. Do you realize like what he's done the last couple of years on two different stops? I enjoyed him. I liked him on the Clippers and he's had three different runs on teams that weren't supposed to be as good as they were where he was involved, right? That 2013 Nuggets team, the heyday of Ty Lawson. I think they won like 57 games. Um, that Clippers team last year, when... All of a sudden, they were like, what, 49 and 33 or whatever. They win a game off the Warriors. And then this OKC team this year, he was a big part of that. Him and Chris Paul and Shea, Shea Gilgis and uh, Steven Adams. That was basically it. But he is somebody that we have seen over and over again does stuff that helps the team. And if he's one of your six guys, you're not going to regret it. Celtics have liked him for 10 years. He's had a weird career because he had bad first impression, 28 games, rookie year. And I think he would be, he'd be like one of your friends that has a good run and then he does something really stupid like once every year. And then you're like, ah, that's what Danilo's career is like. Because just when it seems like it's getting steady, then he misses time. And he gets traded. Dumb injury. And, yeah. yeah. He, he missed the entire 13-14. And then with Denver, he started to put up some pretty big numbers. Again, shorter seasons. But he's played, well, I don't know. I mean, geez, he hasn't played over 70 games since 12, 13. That's really his problem. The perception of him isn't inaccurate that he isn't around a lot, but he is a more productive player than you realize. He's 43 and 41% from three the last couple of years. He's scoring 20 and 19 Clippers last year in 68 games, 55 games at Oklahoma City this year. He's still a decent enough rebounder. He can make a pass, makes his free throws, and he's still only 31 years old. Not yeah. somebody who would be like, where is this guy going in crunch time? Like, I, I actually think the opposite. So, all right. So I had him ranked ninth, and I'm going to take with the ninth pick the guy I had eighth. I just like him. Goran Dragic. Um, third team all NBA in 2014. One of the weirdest careers just uh, like one of the weirdest basketball reference pages you'll look at because he's basically a bench guy for the first five years of his career. And then within a year, he's third team all NBA. And uh, I, he's a guy that if I was a GM, I would have traded for at least once. I've always liked this game. I, I'll never understand why Phoenix tried to put him and Isaiah Thomas together. That was fucking weird. Uh, was valued enough that Miami gave up two unprotected first round picks for him. Like that's how much talent he had. I don't think Gallinari, Eric Gordon, 
a Bach, maybe a Baca would have gone for two unprotected at some point. I don't know, but um, at when he's good, he is a twenty and six, and he's going to make four out of every ten threes. And you can run pick and rolls with them at the end of the game, and is a good playoff guy and single handedly knocked the two thousand ten Spurs out of the playoffs, which was unbelievable as it was happening. Um, I'm a fan. Yeah, two years ago in a full season, he was seventeen. Five and four, and he shot. What was he at? I mean, he's had some big three point shooting seasons. Yeah, he's forty one percent from three. I think he's healthier than people realize. Like last year, he missed a ton of time. He's coming off the bench this year, but he's still scoring sixteen a game for a good Miami team. That if it weren't for their road record, maybe I think could make a little noise in the playoffs. Maybe they still can. But he, you know, before that. Two years ago, you go back 75 games, 73 games, 78 games, 76 games, 77 games. So other than the never starting any of the games and coming off the bench and playing under like 20 minutes a game for four seasons in, or actually, excuse me. Yeah, but, they, like three but we got to say why, though. Because he's Nash's backup. And I think he was, there came a point where he was really overqualified to be a backup point guard in the league. I, I think he was better than probably 10 guys who was actually starting. like. Guys like DJ Augustine were starting games when he was backing up Nash. So, you know, a little bit bad luck there. On the other hand, you could argue playing with Nash, he might have learned some stuff that um, became valuable going forward. But I, I was just really appreciated him. He's one of my favorites. At this point, I think we, we've had close to the same order. It just seems to be we're one off every time where I have a guy that you take, you know, the slot behind. Um, we can start moving faster now, by the way. Probably. George Hill. I'll take him 10th. Good pick. I agree. Um, 26 pick in the actual draft. Good enough to get traded for Kawhi Leonard. I think he's had a really nice resurgence on this Bucks team. He's leading the league in threes at 48% this year. Yeah. There's he really not somebody, much else to add. You know who he is. You know what you're going to get. I think if he's your third guard, you're feeling great. Yeah. If, if you're yeah. in an eight-man rotation and he's playing... 24 minutes a game. You did awesome. He's actually fifth in win shares for this class, too. Interesting. I also, I remember when Zach wrote the piece about the Hill-Leonard trade for us for Grant. Zach Randolph? Zach, Zach Lowe. Oh. And uh, Zach Randolph never wrote for Grant. Um, Pop was, like, devastated when he had to trade George Hill. He loved George Hill. It was just yeah. the right move because... He had Parker, and Parker was still one of the best 15 or 16 guys in the league. And at some point, they needed a wing guy. And they knew it, and they loved Kawhi, and they made the deal. But just think, uh, if they had traded Parker for Valanciunas, then Kawhi's never on the Spurs. and True. Maybe they still have George Hill. And the Celtics could add Robert Swift. Number 11. I'm taking a guy who has made $118 million and counting in his NBA career. No, you're not. I don't even have him in my lottery. Yeah, I'm going three and D. I'm taking Nick Batum. I'm doing it. <laughs> it's I'm tough to be it. three and D when you play zero minutes. Yeah. Well, I liked him for a while. And, you know, unfortunately, he got a giant contract and it fucked him up. And so I, I'm, I am using that giant contract as kind of the torn ACL of Nick Batum's career. But, you know... You're looking at from 2010 all the way through 2018. He is 13, six and five, 35% from three. Like he's basically Wes Matthews or whatever. And he could switch on D with them, all that stuff. I would rather have that than anyone who's left. So just going to add a couple of Batum nuggets. Um, yeah. The advanced metrics haven't liked him in eight years. That Charlotte mm. team isn't loaded. They don't even play him and he's healthy. I think his playoff numbers are pretty bad as well. Not that there's a ton there, but they get even worse. He was he was a guy that had this all-around game and he put it together for Portland there a little bit and they had no problem not Matt like going go ahead, 5 120 million. He still is a 27 million dollar player option next year. Probably going to pick that one up. Um I I just there's more anti Batum stuff for me, but it does get a little scarce here, so I'm not crushing the pick yet. Hold on. Hold on. It doesn't just get a little scarce here. Here's who's left, <laughs> just for the people listening. This is, I'm not happy I took Nick Batum, but 
But here's who's left. JaVale had- McGee, Roy <laughs> Hibbert, Nikola Pekovic, Ryan Anderson, Omer Ashik, Robin Lopez, Michael Beasley, OJ Mayo, Mo the grocery Spates, list. Courtney Lee, Mo Mario Spates. Chalmers, Mozgov. Like, it's not like... It's Jared not like, embraced debate. It's not like my grocery cart was full. Who are you what about taking, Anthony, uh, Anthony Randolph? Different life, maybe? By the way, still haven't given up on him. You always ask me who have I not give up, given up on from this draft. Anthony Randolph. Still waiting for him to become a heat check guy off the bench. Kyle Weaver. A lot of length there. Love who you him. Take, who are you taking uh, at 12? I just think I have to go production, long career. Uh, can be DJ Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I did did not have him on my list. <laughs> Unbelievable. Hold on, I have, to do, I have to do some copy pasting. DJ Why? Augustine, even he's yeah. bummed out that you took him. I, well, <laughs> wait a minute. May, so, so w- w- all right, I, I can't wait. Because I was saving my 14th pick for somebody you weren't going to take. So now I may have jammed myself up unless, I don't know, because I didn't think there's any way the guy I took last is who you were going to take. In your top fourteen, so I may have just screwed myself. I, what's wrong with August? You see them? You see when they beat the Raptors in Game One of the playoffs, and he was like, "Don't you sleep on the Magic?" Look, any dicks. anytime you can get a point guard with a career ten and four, gotta lock that down. There's no way right. to find that. He's gonna be on a roster. He's on a roster really long. It gets really slim here, folks. I Courtney can't believe Lee. he. I can't believe he's played twenty thousand minutes. Yeah, maybe maybe Jesus. you need to maybe you need to brush up on your DJ Augustine before you start killing him. No, that that I know I who you're going to take. I know who you're going to take. Yeah, I'm going to take Javale. Oh my God, you're making fun of me. Yeah, I'm taking Javale. Watched him play on on uh, a team that might have been the best team ever, and he played 9.6 minutes a game. And then in the playoffs, I think he played more than that in the for the 2017 Warriors. He played 9.3 minutes a game. Wow. He's, he's been, been in the league. He's been in the league. Oh, I know. <laughs> Since he's, 2008? The, no, I mean, he's he's been in the league for 12 years, but is still, like, pretty relatively relevant. He's, still, he's playing 17 minutes a game right now for the best team in the league other than Milwaukee. And I, I don't feel like he's on his way out of the league. I he, think he, he can is what he LeBron. is. He can thank LeBron for that, for that offensive production right now. Cause everybody leaves him. Same for Dwight, right? Well, now. let me ask uh, you, is it harder to find JaVale McGee or DJ Augustine? Just in, in the league. What, I don't know. What guy that, is harder to find. Um, That's, that was my mindset completely. Could he play 15 minutes a game for me off the bench as a pick and roll rim protector guy? Yes. Do you so I know? Take, I take JaVale McGee. Do you know that DJ Augustine has a PER for his career of 14.2? Is that good? Do you want to take any of it back? 14.2? That seems high. Well, I'm taking JaVale. I liked his mom. I had a good time with his mom at, at the USC when we did the doc at the party after. She was a delight. Augustine, um, 38% from three in the playoffs for his career. 33 games. Not a small sample. That's pretty good. I'm just screwing with everybody right Maybe, now. Maybe no, we we should do a book. I'll do on the book of basketball Twitter feed. Who who would you take in a redraft? JaVale or DJ Augustine? I'm gonna lose because everybody likes JaVale and now he's on the Lakers and all the Lakers fans are gonna like go crazy. Oh yeah, you're say. right. They ruin everything. I, Laker right. fans just ruin all all good things. All right, last pick. I'm not gonna take him, but he probably should have gone twelve or thirteen, and that's Ryan Anderson. Ryan Anderson mm. filled it up. Now, Ryan Anderson has a little bit of some of the other stuff that we've seen with this class. Is the, the less he started shooting, the team started winning a little bit more because it's like, well, can we give Ryan Anderson all of our shots? Like, how many games do we expect to win? But he lit it up there for a while. Also, you want to take a guess over under? On, well, I'm not going to give you over under. I'll just give you the guess. You want to guess his career earnings? Oh, it's like 130 million, right? Something 100. Crazy. Yeah, he's over 100. 100 mil for Ryan Anderson. Yeah, he was the other guy I was looking at with that last pick. All right, my last pick, though, I'm just going to take him. The stats don't like him. He does not hold up uh, in the advanced stuff. I'm taking Robin Lopez. Hmm. He, if you ask teams, and this was this was one of those things where it was like a trade deadline making the calls, 
And it was like, watch how hard. It's like that Vergeau thing where Vergeau may not get the rebound, but it's going to be annoying all night long trying to battle this guy for rebounds. And he's locked in. He's competitive and all that kind of stuff. And I think for the 14th pick here, none of the traditional stats are going to get you all that excited about Robin Lopez. But I just think he makes things difficult on the opponent. And, and I like guys like that, especially if they're coming off the bench and they're the last pick in the lottery. You know what? That's a better pick than JaVale. I regret my JaVale pick now. I'm with you. I, I've always liked Robin Lopez. For some reason, he bounces around. He's been on six teams. Nobody ever seems totally happy with him, but I've always enjoyed him. That's a good Omar. pick. That's a good ender. Tough, tough podcast for Roy Hibbert. <laughs> or Omar Ashik. Of Roy Hibbert was, you know, we were writing like giant great land features about Roy Hibbert. And then he was out of the league two years later. And, and there's really never been an explanation. You know what? That, that's, that's, that's a great way. Like, cause we've already gone over it here and everybody knows the Roy Hibbert story, but it ended so quickly and it was, he was so relevant so fast. I think that's almost canceling out like how good he was there. Like, should he have been the 13th or 14th pick in this? I, he was in the mix, but this, by the way, this was a really good draft, but you look at uh 2012 and 13 playoffs, 30 playoff games. He averages 15 and 10, 2.4 blocks. Prompts the Kirk Goldsberry verticality feature. Um, and was really ahead of his time. And then the league changed and he got fucked. And it happened with Para and Teach, that Atlanta series when when he uh he just stood 25 feet from the basket and it completely yeah. fucked the Pacers up. And that was it. Can you, can you and imagine that basketball being changed. Can you imagine though? That's like it's one thing when you're a guy who gets cut and you're at the end of your career and you go, okay, look, I, in five years, I'll admit I'm just not good enough, but right now I can't do it. But to be Hibbert and go, so basically because the other guy stands so far away, I suck now. Like, that's it. Yeah. Well, that was fun. 2008, in the books, we will definitely be around when the basketball playoffs hopefully come back. We might be a little spotty the next couple of weeks, just if there's nothing to talk about, but we'll, f we'll figure out something. Ryan Rosillo, pleasure as always. 